If I were to take a poll today, this would be really, really interesting, and I was really tempted to do this, to take a poll today and, and ask you all, what is the purpose of the church? Because I think we'd get a lot of interesting answers. If you could just write it down on a piece of paper and, and nobody knows what you wrote down, I wonder what you would write. What is the purpose of the church? Last week, we talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that glorious day. Well, what happened immediately after that? Well, it is what the church, it is the purpose of the church is laid out for us. But I wonder how many people in here would say something different. There are many, many, many possible answers that we could see in a poll like that. Maybe we would see worship. Is that the purpose of the church? Well, that's something that we do, but I don't think it's the purpose of the church. For you see, if that was the purpose of the church, whenever we got saved, uh, God would just take us on to heaven where our worship would be perfect. Here it's flawed. Amen? It's flawed because we are sinful people uh, attempting to worship a holy, holy, holy God. And so if the purpose of the church was to worship only, then he'd just take us on to heaven whenever we got saved, so our, our worship then would be perfect. Amen? Maybe you think that the purpose of the church is Bible teaching. Well, again, <laughs> if it was Bible teaching, I, I think when you got saved, he would immediately take you to heaven so you would know what the Bible says. You would know even as you are known. So I don't think that's the purpose of the church. Well, um, wh what do you say is the purpose? Today, we're going to talk about the people of priority. Before. That's what all of us born-again believers ought to be, is we ought to be the people of priority. I believe that the only reason God leaves us here after we get saved is because he has a priority. That priority is the salvation of lost souls. Amen? That's his priority. That's his number one priority. That, that, that Christ's death is not in vain. That people come to know him. That people are gloriously saved. That, my friend, is the purpose of the church, to continue on this redeeming priority of the Lord Jesus Christ. John MacArthur wrote something, and I don't always agree with John MacArthur about everything, but I agreed with this statement. He says, if a Christian understands all the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, but fails to understand this closing passage, he has missed the point of the entire book. The passage is the climax and major focal point, not only of this gospel, that is Matthew, but the entire New Testament. It is not an exaggeration to say that in the broadest sense, it is the focal point of all scripture, Old Testament as well as New. I like that. I think he is spot on with that. Often referred to, in Matthew uh, 28, 19, and, uh, or 16, actually, through 20, as the Great Commission, this, this passage is one of the best known in the entire Bible. There are many, many born-again believers that can quote those four verses, uh, and especially 19 and 20. We, we grow up on that, especially in a Baptist church, because we put so much emphasis on global missions. And so that's kind of our marching orders as for missionaries. I've heard preachers preach many sermons. I, I've preached on this text before. Uh, you might hear some of the same things, but I, I, I doubt it because I didn't make you mad the last time. Today might make you a little angry. Sadly, sadly, most Christians have, have never... Um, They've never made application in their personal life of this passage of, of text, this, this great commission. They have never made personal application. 
Jesus said in Luke chapter 19, he said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He said in John chapter 17, verse 18, he says he's praying there and he's praying for all of his followers. He said, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. John chapter 20, in the closing chapters of the Gospel of John, Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. So I believe that, is, that those are the marching orders for all born-again believers. It's easy for us to get lost in the busyness of the church and lose that, that focus on the priority of what we're called to. We, we lose that. We get busy and we just kind of lose our focus. I love the book of Nehemiah. How many of you read the book of Nehemiah? You recall that in, in Nehemiah, and that's not going to be our text, but I, I, I just want to show you something. Uh, it, it looks like the church today. In Nehemiah chapter 1, Nehemiah has a heart for the things of God. He loves the people of God. He loves the city of God. He loves the things of God. He has a heart for God. And so he sees the city and the walls are destroyed. And so he begins to pray about that. As he prays, God makes a way for him to go and begin to rebuild the city and to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. In chapter 2, Nehemiah surveys the work and he issues uh, a, a challenge in chapter 2, verse 17. Look there, if you will. In verse 17, he surveys the damages and then he makes this challenge to the, to the people of Israel. He says, so I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned down. Come, let us rebuild Jerusalem's walls so that we will no longer be a disgrace. In other words, in other words Nehemiah knew that the people of God had become, they had dishonored God with their life. And, and they were a disgrace to the world because they were not what they claimed to be. That is God's chosen people. So he says, we're a disgrace. Let's rebuild Jerusalem. Let's rebuild the city walls so that we are no longer a disgrace to the people and to our Lord. Well, here's one thing that I've learned for sure. When you get committed to the work of the Lord, you can be sure that the, the, the door of opportunity always swings on the hinge of opposition. Same door. They hinge, every, every door of opportunity hinges on the door of opposition. I say it another way. Divine operation always brings demonic opposition. You need to write that down. Let me say it again. Divine operation attracts demonic opposition. You can bet on it. It's coming. Anytime you begin to walk with the Lord and to walk in his will, you're going to meet some opposition. It's coming. It always does. It always has and it always will. In Nehemiah, if you read through the chapter, you find it in chapter uh, three talks about all of the builders and the different places on the walls and the gates where they worked. And then in chapter four, the opposition really shows up, gets real heavy. And in verse, chapter four, verse six, in spite of the opposition, opposition, he says in verse six, so we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to its half in height, for the people, here, here, to me, this is the key phrase of that verse. For the people had the will to keep working. The King James says they had a mind to work. They had made up their mind. They had set their hearts. They were going to accomplish something for God, come heck or high water, in spite of opposition. They were going to do what God had called them to do. Rebuild the walls. Rebuild the gates. To, to provide that protection for his people. I think it's really, really awesome in chapter 6, verse 15. 
The wall was completed in 52 days on the 25th day of the month of Elul. I think that is April, right, brother? Elul? I think it's April. Doesn't matter. Here's the main thing. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. Let me tell you something. When the church begins to accomplish something for God, the church doesn't get recognition. God gets the praise. Even the enemies of the church will say, boy, God is really moving there. God is doing something. That's as it should be, amen? So let's look at our text today. In our text, in Matthew chapter 28, I want you to notice there, there's some key things to a people of God, a church in our particular situation, a, a, a being a people of priority, a people who does not lose the focus for which we are left here, that we are planted here. Um, in verse 16, we must be a willing people. The, do the disciples went there uh, as the Lord had told them. Look at verse uh, 16. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. Now, I I'm going to go back a little ways, just a couple of chapters. And in verse, or chapter 26, uh, verse 32, listen to this. Uh, G Jesus has just said he was going to be killed and rise again the third day. And this is where Peter, uh, uh, he said uh, that there, there's no way that I'll go to you. I'll go with you to the very death. And then he says, in verse 31, then Jesus said to them, tonight all of you will run away because of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been resurrected, notice this, after I've been resurrected, I will go ahead to you to Galilee. So he's already telling them before the crucifixion that I'm going to go ahead of you to a place in Galilee. And then if you look in chapter 28, if you look at verse, let me find it, verse 8, I believe. No, 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 no. Oh, getting the right chapter, Mike. It is. Verse, uh, look first of all at verse 7. This is when uh, the angel uh, met the women at the tomb and... Uh, and, and he gives them his instructions. He says in verse 6, He is not here, for he has been resurrected, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. In fact, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you will see him there. Look in verse 10. Then Jesus, now Jesus meets the women, and he says, go and tell not my disciples, but he says, go and tell my brothers. We're family. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee and they will see me there. And so then we find in chapter 28, verse 11, where they did exactly what Jesus told them to do. He said, go tell my brothers that I'm going before them in Galilee. Now, we don't know exactly where that was or what mountain it was, what place it was or what time it was. We don't know that, but we do know this, that the 11 traveled to Galilee. Now, I don't think it was just the 11. For the angel said in chapter 28, he says, he tells the women, he says, I'm going before you. I'm going before you. So he's also including them, not only the disciples, but he was including the, the ladies who they, who they met at the, at the tomb that day. I believe there was, there was even more people than that. You see, he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for 40 days after the resurrection, he was being seen by many people. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. 
I believe this meeting in Galilee is what Paul was speaking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he said he was seen by over 500 at once. There was a multitude of people who followed the disciples to this meeting place in Galilee. Think about that. Wonder who, was, who could have been there. Maybe blind Bartimaeus, you know, the, the man he healed from his blindness. He was there, I would think. Pro probably Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. He knew what that experience was like, amen? He'd been dead and raised again. So he kind of shared that experience with Jesus. The only difference is Jesus raised Lazarus and Jesus raised himself, amen? So, but he shared that in common. Maybe there was the widow of Nain. Maybe there was the woman who had the issue of blood. Probably old Zacchaeus that he saw up in the sycamore tree that he called down, went to his house and got saved that day. Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe the, like the, the, the man in uh, Jairus and his daughter that Jesus raised from the dead. She also knew what it was like to be raised from the dead. So maybe, maybe they were there. But, but I believe that there was the, at least 500 people who were there at this particular meeting. They followed the disciples. They were simply willing to take Jesus at his word when he said, go there, I'll meet you there. They believed him and they were willing to, they didn't know why. Have, has God ever told you to do something and you really didn't know why? Do you know that there are places in Scripture where God did something miraculous in the lives of some of those people and God said, Jesus said, don't, don't tell anybody. Do you know that? Has Jesus ever told you to do something and he said, don't tell anybody? Or maybe he didn't even tell you why he wanted you to do something. You know why? Because I believe if a lot of us knew what he was telling us to do, what, what the result was going to be, we'd just flat out say, no, I ain't doing it. Mm -mm, not me. I remember when I, when I went to Africa the first time uh, when, to be on a, on a mission trip. It, it took two years for the Lord to finally move me into that, that place where I was willing to go. Now, if he'd have told me at the beginning what... No, I don't want to go through the long story how all this came about, but it came about at a, at a, at a um, lay renewal weekend. How many of y'all know about lay renewal weekends? Any of y'all know about those? You, uh, some of you old people like me, we, we know about lay renewals. I don't think they even have them anymore. But I was going to a lay renewal meeting one night, and, and the man who was doing the speaking saw me come in from way in the back, and, and he, I got about halfway down that front aisle. I was just going to greet him and say hello to him. We were friends. And he says, the Lord wants you. He's calling you. And I thought, huh, really? I ain't heard nothing. Well, what's he want me to do? He said, he wants you to go to Africa. And I said, uh, not me. What's going on in Africa? He says, well, we're going to drill water wells. Mm, not me. Mm -mm. Nope. For two years. I could drive down the highway. It literally happened, but it was almost like I could see Africa written across my windshield. Finally, finally, I said, okay, I give up. I'll go. And God made a way for me to go. One of the most wonderful things I've ever done in my life. But God doesn't always tell you exactly what he's up to in your life. For some of us, if he did, we'd rebel. We never would submit. Amen? Well, I believe that our greatest willingness, our greatest asset to Christ is willingness. Are, are, you, are you willing? That's the, that's the start. You, before God's going to do anything in your life, not because he can, it's because he won't, if you're not willing to do it. It doesn't matter how gifted you are or how talented you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It, none of those things matter. If you're not, first of all, willing to do what God calls you to do, you're probably not going to get done. It, it is a sad thing that there are a lot of talented people, gifted people in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're not being used. And the reason they're not being used is because they're not willing. First step, you've you got to be willing. God doesn't unfold a whole plan for us, so don't, 
Don't count on that. When God calls you and God taps you and he pulls you on a, by the coattail and says, I, I, I want you to do something, don't worry about what it is. He's going to take care of you. He'll meet your need. Just say yes. Just be available. Be teachable. Amen? Our greatest asset, I believe, is willingness. Secondly, we must be an adoring people. Notice what happened. In our text, verse 17, when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. I think that's pretty honest of Matthew to at least include the truth, some doubted. Probably those who, who had somewhere along the way heard about this crowd of people going to meet the supposedly resurrected Jesus in some place in Galilee. And so there were some, there were some travelers that probably latched on to him and and. Obviously, they, they weren't believers. Matthew said they worshiped, but some, notice what he says, but some doubted. Now, <laughs> can you just, can you hear the mumbling in the crowd? Place yourself there. There were those who were saying, who were saying that, that this Jesus did some miraculous thing in their life, and there were some over here saying, well, I ain't, he ain't never done nothing for me. I'm not going to bow down and worship him. He ain't never done nothing for me. You know, I've witnessed to people before, and I would, I would encourage them to submit their life to Jesus Christ, that that was good and safe and, and, and right. And, and their response was, why should I? He ain't never done nothing for me. Well, let me tell you, friend, if you're in that boat, let me tell you something. He's done everything that can possibly be done for you. He took your sin upon himself, laid down, surrendered to a cross and a crucifixion, and died for the forgiveness of your sin. Otherwise, you're condemned to an eternity in separa of separation from God. You're eternally separated from anything that is good, anything that is right. Don't tell me he's never done anything for you. He has. He's done everything he possibly could for you. Amen or oh me? I'm starting to get on some people's nerves. I, I, I think it is, to me, this is an amazing thing. These people were adoring him and worshiping him. Go back just a, a few weeks later or earlier. Jesus was fishing with them. He was eating with them. He was traveling with them. And even though he was the son of God, there was a familiarity with him and his disciples. But now, after the resurrection, now... Now, still the son of God, but there's something different. The familiarity of that relationship was not the same. Now he is reverenced and adored and worshipped as God. His disciples who walked with him for three years, now they adore him and they worship him. Worship, though, is not an end in itself. Amen? So many Christians... They like the worship celebration. Do you like it? I do. That sounded kind of weak. Do, do, do you like the worship celebration? I, I, I don't know of anything I'd rather do, especially on the Lord's Day, than to meet with his people and worship him. But it is not the end in itself. It's not primarily what Christ has called us to do. That's not the first priority of what we're called to do. What, what we do here on Sunday in our Bible study groups and in our time of worship together, because Scripture says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some, and even more as you see the day approaching. That is, that is... The coming again of the Lord. Worship ought to be a priority, but not the first priority of the church. You see, Sunday school, and I know some of you get a little, think it's not masculine, if you call it Sunday school. 
but I like, that's the old tradition. I, I like that. You want to call it a small study group or Bible study group, whatever you want to call it. It's still Sunday school. We're going to school and we're learning. Amen? And it's not just for those of you who don't teach. It's for those that teach probably more so than anybody. But, but watch this. We come to Bible study groups and we come to worship. Listen, not because that's what the church is primarily called to do. We do that to equip us to do the number one priority, which is to be involved in the priority of God, and that is the salvation of lost people. And we come here and we assemble together to be encouraged, to be, uh, to be ministered to, and to also minister to others. And some of us are satisfied with sitting and soaking. We just come to Sunday school and soak it in. We just come to worship and we, we just soak it in. And then we sit on our laurels and do nothing. That's horribly selfish. And it certainly is not what God has called us to as the purpose of the church. Our purpose is to make disciples we are to make disciples. That's what we're called to do. I, I love this. Notice that we are to be... Oh, let me, let me talk about true worship here for just a second. True worship is the adoring response of all the believer is and all that God is and all that God says and does. The motive for true worship is a love for Jesus Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit gives us the power to do that. Do, do, you know that we, do, you, do you know that a lost person can't worship God? Can't do it. A lost person cannot worship Jehovah God. He can worship some God, but not our God. Amen? Y'all are looking at me like a calf staring at a new gate. Are you getting this? Are, are you hearing me, church? Amen? Lost people can't... I don't know why the church wastes so much of our time trying to, trying to uh, uh, create worship services for, for lost people and seekers. Who was it that came out with a book here not long ago... Um, uh, something about being a seeker church, uh, Warren. Um, Purpose driven church, Rick Warren. Yeah, y'all y'all remember that? And he's talking about if you've read the book, he's talking about building worship services that attract the world. Listen, the worship of the church is not for the world. Now we want lost people to come in, but the worship of the church is for that's for born-again believers to motivate them and to encourage them to go out and make disciples. First of all, by evangelism, and then second of all, by discipleship. Because lost people can't worship. Oh, we want them here with us. Amen? We, we, we want to share the gospel. We want to be an inspiration to them, but they can't because the only way you can worship the Lord is in dwelling Holy Spirit. He gives you the power to worship. Now, oh, let me go back here because I want to bring this up. I might not have put it in here. Maybe it's later. I don't know. Third, we must be a submissive people. Look at verse 18. Notice what Jesus says. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We must be a submissive people. Jesus proclaimed his authority, did he not? He said, All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And his resurrection, my friend, is evidence that he has all power. Amen? Truly he does. He says, all authority has been given. All authority has been given to me in heaven 
and on earth. Listen, he is the king of kings to whom every knee will bow and every, one, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen? Daniel prophesied in chapter 7. He says, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. He is the boss. He's king. He is Lord. We are to live in submission to his lordship. Now, if we are to be a people of priority, then we have to be in the will of God. That makes sense pretty, that's pretty elementary, is it not? But it's true. If we're going to be a people of priority, we need to be right in the center of his will. And if we're going to do that, we must submit to his authority. You know what I hear so often from folks is, well, yeah, I know that the Bible says so-and-so, but, but, yada, yada, yada. No, if that's what the Bible says. There is no but. Hello? Right? If that's what Scripture says, there is no but. That's just simply what it says. And we ought to come under the authority of that. We ought to submit to that. I hear, I hear people say a lot, well, I just want to make Jesus Lord of my life. No, you can't. Why can't I? Because he's already Lord of life. Amen? He is Lord of the living. He is Lord of the dead. He is Lord. And no man, no woman, no child, no one ever makes Jesus Lord of their life. says, well, then how do I submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Listen, he is Lord. He already is. You can't make him any more than he is. God said he's Lord. What we have to do is take his Lordship, his kingship, his Lordship, and appropriate that into our life. You know what that means? That means that we must submit to him. And see, we don't like that. We don't like that. Well, I know the Bible says, but. <clears throat> no. Well, a fourth thing, we must be a deliberate people. We must deliberately make disciples. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, Go therefore, and make, because of his authority, and because he is authority, and because he is Lord, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. We must be a deliberate people. You see the word therefore? Because he's Lord, therefore, we must go and make disciples. God didn't place us here to have the best music. Now, I know some of you don't like the music that Brother Jameson puts together. I know that. But, but he, he, didn't, he didn't put us here. He didn't put Brother Jameson here to entertain you with music. He, he, didn't, he, he doesn't put a preacher up here, whoever that is, just so you can hear good preaching. That's, amen? Which, by the way, I'm, I am glad you're here, brother. He, he doesn't give us minds to create the most creative programs. Those are things that help us keep the main thing, the main thing. You know what the main thing is? Making disciples. That's the main thing. It's to, it's to go out and to reach those that are lost and then disciple them so that they can go out and reach the lost and disciple those people so that they, and you get the idea. To make disciples means to help unbelievers become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. 
to help unbelievers become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. What, what is our mission statement? Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Meeting people where they are and leading them to become what God desires them to be. Is that not making disciples? And that's our mission statement. That's what we said we exist for. To, to make disciples is to lead people right where they are and lead them to become what God desires them to be. That's our mission statement. That's what we said we exist for. I was in, in my first work, it was a mission church, we had two deacons. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you their names because you, you might, you might know them. Maybe, well, you probably wouldn't know them. But anyway, there were, there, I had, we had two deacons in that church. One believed in evangelism, 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 evangelism. That's all he wanted to do was knock on doors. The other said, no, we got to teach, we got to teach, we got to teach, we got to teach. So now you got, you got to. A man who believes in soul winning, which is, is good, and that's all he believes in. We'll leave the teaching to this guy. This guy's his belief is, no, my, my responsibility is just to teach. We'll leave the soul winning to them. So you can imagine there was conflict all the time with these two deacons. There was conflict. I'd have one chewing in this ear because this one over here wouldn't go and evangelize. And I'd have this one over here chewing in this ear because that one over there wouldn't help teach or do the work. Friends, listen. It's, it's more than just knocking on doors and it's more than just teaching the Bible. It is making disciples out of people who come to know Jesus Christ. It, it's all of those things. Our priority as Christ's people is to be used of God to make disciples. Do you know that my, making disciples, that's not supposed to happen in the church. Not all of it. It's supposed to start in the home, in the workplace, in the school, in the community, out on the street. That's where it starts, amen? And the church also gets involved in that. But we, we are not supposed to sit back here and wait on would-be disciples to come in. We're to go out there and get them. It wasn't Jesus said, you, you are the light of the world. There's so much light in here, it's blinding sometimes. That light needs to be out there, winning people to Christ. discipling them collectively together. See, discipleship making, disciple making, is, it's not just a, a corporate or collective responsibility. It's an individual. You, you say, well, no. Jesus just told the 11 disciples to go and make disciples. No, he didn't. If he did, then when all the 11 disciples that, that were then at the time, when they died off, that'd be the end of it, right? Wouldn't be any more, right? Chances are you wouldn't know the Lord, right? Are you hearing me, church? If it was an individual, if it was, a, if it was only uh, the disciples at the time that Jesus said this, if it was only their responsibility, then chances are you, you and I'd be hell bound because it wouldn't have been evangelism. In just a short time, just a short period of time, these people, Scripture says, turned the world upside down. Well, i got to hurry up. We must deliberately baptize. Baptism doesn't save anybody, but it is the first step in obedience to following Jesus Christ, is to follow him in baptism. That, that's, that is symbolic of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It is it is identifying with Jesus Christ and it's identifying with the body of Christ. We must be deliberately teaching people. Uh, who was it that uh, Paul said, I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God? 
We must teach scripture. We must be a relying people. Let me, let me close with this. We must be a relying people. Notice what he says in verse 20. Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Teaching everything. Everything. But we got to rely on the leadership of Holy Spirit to do anything. Some of y'all, some of us, we're pretty smart. Well, I don't know about me. We got some pretty smart people in this church. A lot of ingenuity, a lot of creativity. But listen, making disciples doesn't rely on us and our strengths. We are to be relying on him and his power, his might. Let me, let me close with something that I found here not too long ago. I like it. I, I like lighthouses. Do y'all like lighthouses? Huh? I used to sing a song called uh, The Lighthouse. Any of y'all remember that? I found this the other day, and I, I just, I liked it. It says, a lighthouse along a bleak coast was tendered by a keeper who was given enough oil for one month and told to keep the light burning every night. One day, a woman asked for oil so that her children could stay warm. And then a farmer came, and his son needed oil for a lamp so he could read. And still another needed some for an engine. The keeper saw that each was a worthy request and measured out just enough oil to satisfy all need. Near the end of the month, the tank in the lighthouse ran dry. And that night, the beacon was dark and three ships crashed on the rocks. More than 100 lives were lost. When a government official investigated, the man explained what he had done and why. Listen to what he said. You were given one task alone, insisted the official. It was to keep the light burning. Everything else was secondary. There is no defense. We are to be a people of priority, and that priority is to make disciples to the honor and glory of our Lord. And some of us are not applying the scripture to our personal life. You don't know what you're missing. First of all, you're missing the greatest blessing anybody could ever experience. And that is to know that you're sharing your faith, your witness led them to accept Christ as Savior. Great blessing. So you're not being, a, you're not being blessed, you're not experiencing that, and you're not being obedient to the Lord. Now, I, I don't think I'm the one that said that. I'm saying <laughs> he's the one who has the authority, and he's the one who said, go make disciples. And so it makes pretty good sense to me that if you're not doing that, you're living in disobedience. 